Hi, it's me, Karen Romano Young. Are you ready to read another bit of A Girl, A Raccoon, and the Midnight Moon? Uh, we're in chapter 31, Down the Basement Stairs, and I'm starting on page 251. Too long a chapter to read all in one day. Monday morning, Pearl and Francine planned to walk to school together like always, but Pearl buzzed Francine's door half an hour before schedule. Into the intercom, she called, Can you hurry? Something's come up. While Francine was clattering down the stairs, Pearl stood peering through the metal grate that kept Gully's store safe from robbers while it was closed. Francine came and gazed at the cheap stuff inside too. What are you looking at? Pearl pointed into Gully's window. We need to make the neighborhood into raccoons too. You're gonna make me into a raccoon, said Oleg, coming up behind them. Oleg was Pearl's chance to test her new part of the story, to start building it into the performance. This neighborhood is known for extra smart raccoons, didn't you know that? No, scientific Oleg looked skeptical. They're self-educated, actually. They descend from the legendary Mrs. Malamar. And you know what makes them special? What? asked Francine eagerly, as if she hadn't already heard the story. She's such a good performer, Pearl thought. They're reading raccoons, Pearl said. They can read? asked Oleg. Sure, said Pearl. Suspend your disbelief. It was something Alice told her readers to do when they read fantasy. Suspend it? Yeah, the same way you do if you read In Search of Sasquatch, even though you know there's no such thing as Bigfoot. In Search of Sasquatch by Kelly Milner Halls. HMH Books for Young Readers, 2011. Or believe in a flying snitch when you know there's no such thing as Quidditch? Just buy it. You, any human, can be a reading raccoon. You can read and write and have library cards and support the Lancaster Avenue Branch Library. Believe me. And it seemed like he did. At school, Pearl looked around, thinking about the kids and how they'd respond to the reading raccoons. As she pondered her story, she had the feeling she sometimes had when she read certain books where kids did things she couldn't do. Actions with outcomes that just wouldn't happen in real life. Things that seemed too magic, too convenient, too unrealistic. Magically bumping into someone who was just the person you were looking for. Magically looking out the window, just in time to see a giant going by. Magically being the one with exactly the magical powers the situation called for, without having done a single thing but be born. That sort of stuff had occasionally made her want to throw a book at the wall. If her own story now was in a book, would she believe it? Huh. This worried her more than it would have worried another kid, anyone else not born in a library. Maybe in a book she could save the library, but in real life? Later that night, Pearl tucked herself into the book elevator, asked Simon to push three, and ascended to pay Bruce a visit. He was redoing the budget he would present at the library board meeting tomorrow night. He had been redoing the budget for weeks. It had been the reason for debates, fights, canceled plans, gray hairs and wrinkles, and the excuse for extra coffee, extra donuts, extra hours, extra worry, and extra privacy. But now Pearl had questions. She sprang out of the book elevator. What would magically fix the budget? She asked. Magically, said Bruce, distracted but not grumping. If the whole world had a lottery and our library won it. Seriously, Pearl asked. He nodded. Miss Moran, what is the actual purpose of this visit? Pearl pointed to the top of the file cabinet, to the raccoon head that sat up there. She knew there would be power in actually being a raccoon. And here was the costume, right here. But Bruce was standing in her way. When she had first seen the costume five years ago, Pearl had told him he should rename it Mrs. Malamar. But Bruce would not make jokes about the costume. He was six feet, three inches, and his raccoon costume had been made to fit him. At his old job at the National Park, he used to put it on and walk around talking about wildlife to kids. He never wore it anymore, but was fiercely protective about it. Now he said, what about it? Can I wear it? She asked. You cannot. Why? She wailed. I need it for school. 
School was where she was going to try out the newest part of the story, the part where Vincent would invite the first raccoon who moved into the library basement to read an actual book. It's a sentimental costume, said Bruce. It's very dear to me. Am I not very dear to you? He smiled into her eyes. You are, but I wouldn't want it to get dirty, and it would. She began a rebuttal, but he held up his finger. Besides, you're not tall enough for it. It was made for me. It would trip you up and the eyes would fall out of position and you'd be blind and it would make you fall and get hurt and that would be catastrophic and the costume would be ruined. For a moment, Pearl was silent. Then, that's kind of dramatic. Did you ever think of being an actor? I've had enough careers, said Bruce. Anyway, if I go back to the parks, I'm going to need that raccoon costume. It has to stay mint. I don't believe you're going back to the parks, said Pearl. She refused to, in fact. What would you do without us? What would we do without you? Bruce got up from his chair and walked to the window and stood looking down at poor, lovely old Vincent. Pearl couldn't see his eyes because the light was behind him when he turned his back to the window. Pearly girl, don't you know? You're getting taller, have you noticed? Like a sprout. I bet you've grown two inches since school started. She had to admit, I went up a shoe size. Right, and you know what's next? College. Her shoulders drooped and she threw her head back and gazed at the ceiling. Then she said, and I'm tall enough to see over the top of the atlas even while I'm sitting down. So maybe it will fit me now. Be small for a while longer, Bruce said, his voice husky all of a sudden. Stay innocent. Be the librarian's child while there's still a library to be the child in. A sidebar about fathers. Where did you come from, baby dear? Out of the everywhere, into the here. From the poem Baby, from a Victorian anthology by George MacDonald, edited by Edmund Clarence Stedman, Riverside Press, 1895. Presumably, you know how babies get made. But to be sure, we're on the same page. The father produces a lot of sperm, and one of them might be lucky enough to fertilize the mother's egg. The egg stays inside the mother and develops into a kit, or a kid, depending on your species, all with nothing more needed from the father. A kid without a dad around might seem to be 100% influenced by his or her mother, but that's not the truth of things. Science says 50% is the father, and it shows up in all kinds of ways, like size, strength, voice, sense of humor, eyes, facial expressions, and in other ways too, ways that only your mama would recognize. Sometimes you can simply assume these things. Other times you know for sure. But the other thing about absent fathers is that whoever's near you tends to have an influence that's just as profound. Whether you're a human or a raccoon, in the end you might conclude that actually having a father around doesn't matter as much as having somebody. Pearl's somebody was Bruce, and he was talking about leaving. So she worked extra hard to make him mad how else could she show him how much she cared? How much could she find out how much, whoops, that's a typo, a typo. How else could she find out how much he cared by M-A-M? -M. That's the second typo I found in this book, and I wonder where the first one is, if you know. Ask a thousand times, said Bruce, and a thousand times I will say no. Nothing's going to change about that. Pearl couldn't help stepping away and slumping into a chair. Everything changes, she said. Isn't that what you all keep telling me? She slithered out of the chair and onto the floor. She crawled across it on hands and knees, difficult in a long uniform skirt. On her way past the coat rack, she whipped up the tail of the raccoon costume so it swung and swooshed. In the doorway, she hopped to her feet and was gone. See you tomorrow. Thank you for listening.